Uh, it's my uh, pleasure and great privilege to introduce our next keynote speaker, a man I just uh, started to get to know yesterday and is a truly exceptional person, a real, uh, one of the outstanding civil rights leaders of our generation that we couldn't be more pleased to have him with us today. And obviously I'm, I'm speaking of uh, Fred Gray. And I'll give a little bit of his uh, biography before, it, before bringing him up to the podium. Uh, Mr. Gray was born in Montgomery, Alabama and is a graduate of the Nashville Christian Institute in Nashville, Tennessee, Alabama State University in Montgomery, Alabama, and Case Western Reserve University School of Law in Cleveland, Ohio. Currently, he is senior partner in the law firm of Gray, Langford, Sapp, McGowan, Gray, and Nathanson, which has law offices in Tuskegee and Montgomery. Mr. Gray began his career as a solo practitioner less than a year out of law school, and at age 24, he represented Ms. Rosa Parks, who, as we all know, refused to give up her seat to a white man on a city bus, the action that initiated the Montgomery bus boy boycott. Mr. Gray was also Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s first civil rights lawyer. This was the beginning of a legal career that now spans over 55 years. In 1985, he served as president of the National Bar Association, and in 2002, he became the first African-American president of the, of the Alabama Bar Association. Mr. Gray is the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including the American Bar Association's Spirit of Excellence Award and the National Bar Association's C. Francis Stratford Award. Mr. Gray serves on the Board of Trustees for Southern, uh, Southwestern Christian College, a historically black college affiliated with the Church of Christ, and on the board of the Alabama Department of Archives and History. Critically for the purposes of today's talk, Mr. Gray was the plaintiff's lawyer in Pollard versus, Uni versus the United States of, uh, of America, uh, the litigation that resulted in the settlement for the uh, victims of the Tuskegee syphilis study. In addition, in 1997, Mr. Gray encouraged the President of the United States to make an official apology to the participants of the Tuskegee syphilis study. The participants also requested a memorial in their honor. The apology was made at the White House in May of 1997, and that same year saw the founding of the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center in Tuskegee, Alabama, which serves as a memorial to the participants of the study and educates the public on the contributions made in the field of human and civil rights by Native Americans, African Americans, and Americans of European descent. As of 2007, Mr. Gray serves as president of the center. In 1995, Mr. Gray published his autobiography, Bus Ride to Justice, The Life and Works of Fred Gray. Mr. Gray has left a remarkable uh, legacy as the foremost civil rights attorney in Alabama history. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Fred Gray. Give you one of these pictures as well. We, ha we have two of them, so we're not giving the same one away twice. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that back. Thank you. thank you, Dean. I simply want to thank uh, this law school and thank each of you for. Uh, your presence here this morning. As the first civil rights lawyer for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and as the only living survivor of the persons who made the detailed planning for the Montgomery bus boycott, and as one of the two persons, me along with Joanne Robinson, who on December the 1st and December the 2nd of 1955, as we were planning the Montgomery bus boycott, at the suggestion of Mrs. Joanne Robinson, we suggested to the Montgomery community that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. be the spokesman for the group as we made the detailed plans for the Montgomery bus boycott. And since Joanne is no longer with us, along with the other persons who did the planning, 
And since today is the anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., I think it's appropriate that we take a moment of silence in memory of my client and the great American, Dr. Martin Luther King, if you will. Thank you. Let's give a special acknowledgement to Dr. James Jones, who was our first speaker. He is the person who located those records in some 400 and some boxes in the National Archives when the government lawyers couldn't find them. He has done an excellent job here this morning of setting the stage for your conference. So let's just stand and give him a real, a real University of Michigan And while you're standing, let's also do the same thing for Professor Amy Campbell. She's done an excellent job. Almost six months ago, I received a phone call, and also an email from Professor Campbell. She identified herself and told me that she was the director of the newly formed Health Law Institute at the University of Memphis School of Law and that uh, this school would be hosting an inaugurable health law symposium next spring. She told me that the theme would be around race, research, rights, with the Tuskegee syphilis study and its legacy our focus point for discussion. She also invited me to be a part of that inaugurable symposium. That invitation was followed by a phone call and an email from my good friend, Dr. Jim Jones, who encouraged me to accept the invitation and join him here today. And considering what he did for me and what he did for my clients in the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, I couldn't turn him down, even if I wanted to turn Amy down. <laughs> and I didn't turn either one down. I'm glad I was able to come. Several months later, en route to visit my older brother in Philadelphia, I was going, coming through D.C. and I called Jim and stopped by and we spent a few moments together talking about this event today. I just want the dean to know and want Professor Campbell to know and want you to know how much I appreciate this invitation to share with you the views of these 623 men and now for a long period of time, spanning about 42 years, I have been almost the lone voice for those men expressing their views. There are a lot of people who have expressed a lot of views on how bad the Tuskegee Syphilis study was. There are a lot of individuals, there are a lot of schools, there are a lot of corporations who have gotten millions of dollars in funds and have done many good program on the backs of those men. But very few of them really knew the men and none of them could really speak for them because I have been that voice and I'm just delighted to be so. How did I become involved in it in the first place? And I know that's what you're wondering about. 
But before I tell you that, I have to, you have to understand how I got to be a lawyer because I have not always been one who wanted to be a lawyer. When I grew up in Montgomery, the cradle of the Confederacy, in the late 40s and early 50s, there was about two things that a black boy in Montgomery professions that he could look forward to being. And that would either be a preacher or be a teacher. And if he did either one of them, it would be done on a segregated basis because all the churches were segregated and all the schools were segregated and everything else was segregated. So I decided I'd be both. After going to a church boarding school and coming back, learning a little something about preaching, I came back to Montgomery to go to Alabama State College to learn how to be a teacher. I lived on the east side, of, west side of town, Alabama State's on the east side. I used the transportation system, realized all the problems that our people were having on the buses, and realized that everything was completely segregated. And I made a personal secret commitment that I kept secret for a long time. And that was I was going to finish Alabama State going to go to somebody's law school, not apply to the University of Alabama because I knew they wouldn't accept me, finish law school, return to Alabama, take the bar exam, even though at that time, if you finished the University of Alabama, you didn't have to take an exam, you were admitted on motion. Pass the bar exam, become a lawyer, and destroy everything segregated I could find. <laughs> now for a black boy in Montgomery in his early teens to think like that, probably was thinking a little bit out of the box. I finished Alabama State in May of 51, enrolled in Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, now uh, Western Reserve University then, now Case Western. in September of 1951, finished in three years. In June of 54, during the same month, I stopped by Columbus and took the Ohio bar exam, just in case. <laughs> Four weeks later, I took the Alabama bar exam, and in August of 54, I was told I had passed both and on September the 7th, 1954, I was practicing law. I was admitted by the Supreme Court of Alabama to practice law in that court, and I have been practicing ever since. So then, with that background, on July the 27th, 1972, almost 42 years ago, <coughs> Mr. Charlie Pollard walked into my office with a copy of the local newspaper, the Montgomery Advertiser. He told me that he didn't know whether I'd been reading about it in the paper or not, but he was one of those men in what had become known as the Tuskegee study. He didn't realize that he was involved in the study but he think his government had taken advantage of him and wanted to know if I could do something about it. I told him I thought I could. This was my introduction to what has become known as the Tuskegee Sifty Study. It was also my introduction to a career of now spending almost 42 years that I have been their voice. Within a year, I filed a lawsuit on that on behalf of these men, those who were living, and on behalf of the estate of those who were dead. Within two and a half years, we reached a settlement and that settlement could not, in my opinion, and would not have taken place, and certainly would not have taken place at the time it did, if at all, 
had it not been for Jim Jones. And he has told you already how he went about doing that. He discovered the documents that the government lawyers could not find, scattered in over 400 boxes at the National Archives. And Jim had read in the newspaper about I was representing these men. And one day I got a phone call. Thank God for the telephones. And the person on the other hand identified himself as Jim Jones, told me he was a historian that he had been working on the Tuskegee Syphilis study for some time. And he had some records he thought I was interested in. And was I interested in the records that he had? <laughs> And in a short period of time, as soon as I could get on a plane, I ended up going to Jim, and he's told you something about our meeting, and I appreciate that, and he did that also last night. That was my introduction. That's how I became involved in it. And I have been asked today to talk to you about the experience of litigating the class action suit. And that suit is under the style of Charlie Pollard and others versus the United States of America. Now that you have heard the historical aspect of it, if you were to read, and I hope you do, the detailed account of the study in the Bus Ride to Justice, a lot of what I'm going to tell you will be found there. In chapter, I think it's 19 in Bus Ride to Justice, and then in the Tuskegee Syphilis study, it tells the whole story. But let me tell you, after Mr. Pollock came into the office, <coughs> And when I asked him to go back and contact all of the men that he knew in the study and have them to come in, and when we interviewed all of those persons to try to find out what the facts were all about, we reached the following conclusions during that interval period from the time he came in my office until almost a year later when we filed the lawsuit. And this is what we concluded. Our investigation disclosed that the United States government violated the constitutional rights of the participants in the manner in which the study was conducted. The second thing we found was that the government, our government, the federal government, knew that the participants, or some of them, had syphilis and failed to treat them. Even after penicillin became generally accepted as a means of adequately treating syphilis. Third, the Public Health Service failed to fully disclose to them that they had syphilis, that they were participating in the study, and that the treatment was available, and that treatment was available. We also found that the Public Health Service led them to believe that they were being properly treated for whatever disease they had when they were not, in fact, continuously treating them for the diseases which they had. We also found that the Public Health Service failed to obtain the petitioner's, petitioner's written consent to be a part of a study. The study, we found, was also racially motivated and it discriminated against African Americans in that no whites were selected to participate in the study, and only those who were poor, uneducated, rural, and African Americans were 
recruit it. And finally, we found overall and generally there were no rules and regulations, no protocol at all governing how that study would be conducted. They just kind of made the rules up as they went along and did whatever they thought they wanted to do. We thought that was wrong. And while there may not have been at that time any criminal laws on the book which prohibited, certainly the civil laws were being violated and these men and their families' rights were being violated. After reaching these conclusions and doing our preliminary research, we concluded that we needed to two basic things we needed if we were going to proceed with this case. And at this time, because I had a very small law firm, only two lawyers involved in it, and at the same time that I was involved in this case, I had already been practicing law now for about 18 years. I had had over between eight and ten or more cases that had gone all the way to the United States Supreme Court and had argued one of them. We had filed lawsuits alleging that the governors of Alabama were discriminating against African Americans, both against Governor John Patterson and Governor Wallace. We had filed lawsuits against the Attorney General of the state of Alabama and we had defended suits that the Attorney General had filed on behalf of the state of Alabama against the NAACP and enjoined them from doing business, which case went up to the Supreme Court during that interval four times, six times, three times through the state court system and three times to the, through the federal court system. I've been involved in filing lawsuits that desegregated the University of Alabama, Auburn University, Florence State University, all of these activities under the control of the State Board of Education, and suits that desegregated 105 of the 101, 119 grade schools and uh, elementary and, and secondary schools in the state of Alabama. And at the same time, in 1970, I had just been elected as one of the first two blacks to serve in the Alabama legislature. So Fred Gray's plate was full <laughs> when Mr. Pollock came into his office. And to tell you the truth, I wasn't quite giving this case all the attention that my wife of over later 40 years who then passed, she thought that this was the most important case I ever had and I'm fooling around with the legislature and other things and not giving proper attention to it. But it came at a time and we had all these other things but we ended up finally deciding there were two basic things that I needed in this case if I was going to adequately represent these men. One, Whenever you undertake the federal government, you have a tiger by the tail. They have all the resources. They have all the money. They have all the lawyers. They have everything. And I had been, as I had filed these lawsuits against the state officials and county officials and city officials in the state of Alabama carrying out my overall desire to destroy everything segregated I could find. I now find that these same lawyers who were working with me on those cases are now on the other side. And how do you beat your own federal government? Well, I knew I needed at least two things. 
probably needed a lot more, but two were readily available. Number one, it takes money to finance a lawsuit. And civil rights lawyers in those days didn't make any money hardly on civil rights cases. Now if you win, and of course it's hard to win them now, you can get some money. But in those days you didn't even have that. So just to get the case ready to file and not to mention the trial and not to mention the discovery, we needed some money. And that wasn't the only thing. Dr. Uh, Jerry Frankham Johnson, Jr., who was our only federal district judge in Montgomery at the time, was a no-nonsense judge. When you file a suit in his court, you need to be ready to file all the memorandums and be ready to go to trial in a short period of time because he's not going to put it off and not going to let you put it off. So I knew from all of my experience with all of these cases and, all, and most of them had been before him that he was going to have me preparing legal memorandums and responding to orders that he would issue. And I knew he was going to give me a very short period of time to do it. And I also knew that when we filed the lawsuit, it was going to have to be against the federal government. It was going to also be against at least two of the lawyers, or two of the doctors you've seen here, Dr. Olinsky and Heller. It was going to also be against the health office of the state of Alabama, Dr. Miles. So we were going to have lawyers on the other side, the best lawyers that the federal government had, including all of those in the U.S. Attorney for the Middle District of Alabama and those in the Justice Department in Washington. And then with the Ira Miles being the, the state health officer, we were going to have all of the Attorney General lawyers and all the other lawyers that they wanted to employ. I did not underestimate the opposition, and I knew I needed some legal assistance. So one of the major problems was to try to find a law firm across the country who I would be willing to share a fee with if they would be willing, one, to finance the case, and two, supply for me the various legal research and drafting of documents that needed to be drafted. I tried big law firms, public service law firms, all over this country and couldn't find one who would help. They were sympathetic. They thought it was bad. They thought something ought to happen, but they weren't willing to put the resources of their law firm behind the lawsuit. I talked to Jack Greenberg, who was then director counsel of the in the ACP Legal Defense Fund. And I had been working with them ever since the Montgomery bus boycott when I was appointed to do the legal work then after Ms. Parge was arrested in December of 55 and I got on the phone and had enough sense to call Thurgood Marshall and ask for his help in that case and he gave it to me and was counsel of record in the first federal suit I filed, Browder versus Gale. And I talked with uh, Jack, and Jack had worked with us, and they were working with me on a lot of these other cases. But this was a potentially fee-generating case, and he said that they wouldn't be able to help. However, Jack says, I know the dean of a law school at Columbia University, Michael Sovereign. Let me talk with him, and I may be able to get the dean and some of his law professors to give you the legal research that you needed. Well, you can't get everything from one source. You get what you can. The result of that conference was that Dean Savant and Harold Edgar, one of the professors at the law school at Columbia, 
agreed to work with me on the case and I worked out a fee arrangement and they supplied for me the legal research that I would need as I moved along. Well, that was part of a solution to my problem. What about the money? Law professors don't usually have a whole lot of money and certainly not to end up shutting out to own a case that's a <laughs> that is a, 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 a contingent fee case or one that you are expecting the government or expecting the court to award a fee for you. So I said, well, if I can't do it there, we have a local bank right across the street. I know the president of the bank, I've closed loans for him, done some legal work for him, and had some loans at the bank then, had little money in it, not much in, in the bank. So I go over and talk to Mr. Allen Parker, white banker, who uh, was really a person that both whites and black respected in the community. And that bank had really helped a predominantly black community to exist. And I talked with him about my case. Well, he already knew about it. And he says, well, I tell you what. He said, now I'll lend you the money. But it won't be on a contingent fee basis. <laughs> the bank will have to be paid back with interest. But what I will do is arrange it where it won't be due until at least you know either you're going to be able to get some money or you won't. So you can start paying it back. I had my arrangement with my banker. I had my arrangement with the dean of Columbia Law School. And we ended up then being able to file our amendment to our complaint within a year after we had filed the initial complaint. But that was so, and that's what we did on January 24th. But I had some other real problems. We concluded then that we would uh, file the lawsuit on behalf of living, you had two groups of people involved. You had some who had syphilis and some who didn't have syphilis. You had some in each group were living and some were dead. So we filed a suit on behalf of one class for those who were living syphilis and those who were living control. That was easy. Then we filed it initially on behalf of the widows and heirs of the deceased. But you probate lawyers and you litigators know that the heirs and widows in many instances are not the proper person to represent an estate, but the personal representative of the estate. So we had over 300 of these people who were dead in, when you take both categories, some dead syphilitic, some dead control. The court and the government insisted that I have a proper party plaintiff in the lawsuit. What does that mean? Open up 300 and some administrations in a small county like Macon. With a probate judge who only has about one or two clerical people in his office. And who's not a lawyer himself. But we had a good probate judge who was basically willing to transfer the work that would normally be done in his office to my office. And we ended up opening over 300 estates within the time frame that the court had set. Now, the dean of the law school at Columbia and the professor up there couldn't do anything to help us with that. We had to do that ourselves. We were able to do it. And then 
when we got the phone call and when we got into the discovery stage, we were, everybody admitted, the government said that we know that there are records. We know that there are some plagues. But we have had the folks in the public health service where they were generated. We have had them to check. And nobody can find any of these records. Now it seems mighty strange that here's a study that's been going on for 40 years. And every year, at least once a year, they come in and, and, and check on these 600 and some folks. There ought to be some records. And that's where Dr. Jim Jones entered the picture. And once he gave us the information, and once I went back and conveyed that information to the court, then they were willing to go and they were able to find those records where Jim Jones had told us they were and he has already told you as a result of that. That really is what happened that caused us to be in the position to sell the lawsuit. We negotiated the best settlement we could what we wanted to be sure of as we negotiated a settlement is that at least all of the participants, the living ones and the heirs of the deceased one, would get some money. Because we never, and on these settlements, you know how to get what you want, but you get the very best you can under the facts and circumstances, realizing that the suit is against the federal government and you can only sue the federal government on the certain terms and conditions and the way it's set out that you have to do it. And it's always a disadvantage as compared to what you do with other litigants. And considering the time element and all of the other factors involved, we ended up reaching the best, very best cell map we could have. We started out initially with the study with very few individuals. We didn't know who the heirs were. But then when we got a little pot of money, we had people coming out of the woodworks from all over the country. And we got to a point where we had to have hearings to determine who the heirs are. But we got through it and we worked it along. And in the settlement, in addition to the financial settlement, we was able to get as a part of the settlement agreement and a part of the court order that the medical health program that the government was doing voluntarily became a part of the settlement and a part of the court order including the death benefits because we didn't want the government if we had not included that as a part of the settlement you could get a new administration in or somebody else or Congress decide they don't want to appropriate the money and then we would be out so we wanted to be sure that we could get the very best settlement that we could under the circumstances and I think we did some years later Time rolls on now to about 1997. Because we're still in the process of trying to distribute this little money. And believe it or not, over the next 25 years, we distributed the money to over 9,000 heirs. And that took a considerable amount of time and effort. And I received a phone call one day from uh, a court reporter who was asking me something about an apology. She assumed that someone, since I represented the men in the Tuskegee Syphilis study, there was a group who had been talking to the president and others about an apology for the men in the study. 
And she thought, since I represented him, whoever those people were who were trying to get an apology would have at least said something to the men of their families, of their lawyers. But did they do that? No. Nobody said a word to me, and all the press knew that I represented them. Nobody had said a word to any of the men. people who became interested in the men for whatever reason made the same mistake initially that the government had made and that is they were going to do something for these men but was not going to confer with them about it as to what they wanted and even when the committee was uh, the commission was appointed to investigate it they talked to everybody about it, but the men. Finally, they wrote a letter to Mr. Pollock and invited him to testify before. And he did what a good client should do. He brought it to the lawyer. I said, fine, Mr. Pollock, I'll take care of it. I wrote him a nice letter and told him I'd be happy uh, for Mr. Pollock to come and testify, and I will accompany him. And guess what? They didn't want me, and they didn't want Mr. Pollock. So the voice of those men was never heard before that Blue Ribbon Committee that suggested that the uh, study be stopped and all the other good things that they were interested in. But during the process, however, Senator Kennedy was chair of the Senate Health Committee, a subcommittee of it. He became very interested in it, and he wrote me a letter and invited me on two separate occasions to bring two members of the, in the study, to Washington to testify before his committee. And I took Herman Shaw and Charlie Pollard and uh, uh, Mr. Scott and uh, Mr. Howard up on two separate occasions and they testified. As a result of that, legislation was passed by Congress which currently prohibits so that what happened to these men could not happen that way today. So out of all of it, there was something good legislatively that has helped. But then, back to the conversation with the newspaper person. About the same time, and this was in February of 1997, I had been invited to do a, a Black History Month program, uh, one of the municipalities on Long Island in New York. And after finishing my uh, speech, I saw on, I think it was HBO, they had Miss Elvis Boys. This was a play that had been made into a documentary which supposed to be depicting what happened in the Tuskegee Sister Study. I sat and I watched it and I couldn't believe what I saw because it did not sound like the same thing that I had received information from and that I had been representing these men over all of these years. And incidentally, the man who wrote the play did like the rest of them. Never talked to the men involved, never talked to their lawyer involved. I immediately got on the phone and called my assistant back in Tuskegee and said, told her what I had uh, seen on television, told her to make arrangements, get a copy of it, contact all the men who were in the area. I wanted them to come in and wanted them to see it so they could tell me what they thought about it 
And at the same time, I was going to discuss with them the business about the apology that I had heard about. And when the lady told me uh, that this group had been trying to get an apology and had been doing it for several years and had been successful, I thought it was a good idea. You know, even though you don't come up with ideas, if it's good, then it's fine. I wanted to find out who those people were because I thought I had an idea as to something we could do to help get done what they had started. And we worked on it. So uh, once that we got to that point, when Joanne, who was my sister, set this meeting up with the men and we saw the story, they were convinced that they was not in the first place, it was Ms. Evers' boys. And they said that we were grown men, we're not boys, we're nobody's boys. And these persons really were leaders in their community. You may not have thought much about their communities, but they were leaders in their community. And they said, we want them to know that we are not boys and that that is not what we were involved in. Then I told them, I said, well, you know, there's a group also who want the president to make an apology. They said, well, we're interested in that too. We would like for you to do that. And then they also said something else. They said that what we would want also is we want a permanent memorial in Tuskegee that shows the contributions that we have made to our nation even though we did it unwittingly. And all of that fell right in line with what my uh, late wife thought. We had been talking about the possibility of a history museum in Tuskegee because one, these men said they wanted a memorial for them. Then two, there had been so much precedent setting cases that had come out of Tuskegee that people don't know about because the people who were involved in it weren't concerned about being known, but they wanted it done because the first voting rights cases in Alabama weren't in Montgomery, weren't in Selma, weren't in Birmingham. They were in Tuskegee in the early 40s with Thurgood Marshall and Arthur Shores, a black lawyer out of Birmingham who was my mentor and who had been practicing and doing civil rights work in Alabama since the late 30s. So what my wife said is what we ought to do is, 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 is try to get a history museum. And that was all about the same time and I said fine. Unfortunately, she became seriously ill and died unexpectedly. And so for the next few weeks, we had to end up dealing with her death. And when we got to a point in it, I had a daughter and had a niece who was a, a TV reporter in D.C. and her husband also was in a news assignment editor at one of the television stations in D.C. While we were preparing for her funeral, we also were talking about what we can do about this history museum and what we can do about getting the word out to help get an apology. And after we got things ready for the funeral, we, the assignment editor said, what we ought to try to do is, is, is number one, Folks don't care anything about lawyers, but they'll listen to these men. If somehow you can get a, 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 a conference with the men being out front, let them tell their story. If you can get that message out, and if you can get some media on it, you may be able to come up with something. But the news, the TV news assignment editor said, what you're going to have to do, though, you're going to have to have a, a press release that's good enough to whet an assignment editor's appetite that he wants it, 
but you don't give him enough or too much that he can do a story without it. So you're going to have to be careful how you do it. I had some knowledge of some national news media, and I called the folks I knew and asked them, I said, if we were to have a press conference, say in Nota Sova, where Mr. Pollard, who was the lead plaintiff, <clears throat> lived, if we were able to have a press conference there, do you think we could get media from across the nation? And he said, well, you know, uh, I think you could get some local coverage, but I don't think you could get any national coverage. That wasn't very encouraging, but that wasn't the first time. We went ahead and we ended up getting a press release calling for a meeting, a press conference to be held at Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church in Notasoga, the same place where Mr. Pollock was uh, uh, recruited and told them that we were going to have these men present and told them that uh, they were going to be talking about their experience. They thought the government had treated them wrong and they wanted to join with this other group, whoever they are, in asking for an apology. As soon as that press release got out, in less than 24 hours, I, my phone began to ring from news media across the nation. Some of them wanted to send people down before. The conference was called for April 8, 1997. And when that meeting took place, we had over 40 media people from across the country. And it was the lead story across the nation of the evening of April 8th. These men told their story. The next morning, I got a phone call from Ben Johnson, who was administrative assistant to President uh, What's our president name? <laughs> yeah, yeah. President uh, Clinton. President Clinton. Ben Johnson called and told me that the president is going to make an apology to those men. And he said, I can't tell you when, but we want you to know, and the president wants you to know and want us to work on it. I told Mr. Johnson, and I confirmed it later in a letter, I said, now what I want you to do, I don't want you to do what everybody else has done. If the president is going to make an apology to these men, they need to be involved in the planning of it because they are the ones involved. And from that point forward, they were involved in the planning. I contacted, uh, I'm in contact with Ben Johnson. He would tell me what he wanted. I wanted to be sure that we would have the men there, that there'd be a representative with them that could come up. I wanted to be sure that one of those men participated in the uh, activities to the extent of introducing the president. And I was going to assist them and be sure that while they may think he is uneducated, we think we can work with those men and they can make a good presentation. We had, not only were these individuals, and we had about 30 or more of their heirs who were there. And uh, Jim has told you something about all of the other people. They had all sorts of people who were at the East Wing of the White House. And Herman Shaw was called upon to make remarks and introduce the president. You will find in the back of my book his remarks, and I think you will find they were accurate and appropriate. And he told the president, thanked him for bringing us, thanked him for what he did, told him we thought the government was wrong, he announced the formation of the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center and told the president, we want a permanent memorial in Tuskegee 
and we want you to help him. Help us do it. When the president got up, and if you look at his, his statement, you'll see, he said, we're going to help you build that memorial. Now, President Clinton didn't know that the people who were involved in asking for it, other than the men, were talking about a bioethics center for Tuskegee University. And Tuskegee University got that bioethics center with millions of dollars from the federal government is doing well. However, the men again didn't get any federal funds for their museum. But again, Fred Gray didn't stop. We went ahead and we have built in Tuskegee a permanent memorial for the men in the Tuskegee Syphilis Study. And we did it by me making speeches as I'm making them. And in lieu of an honorarium coming to me, and I needed it, but I wanted it to go to the Multicultural Center because we have been able to build one of the best small museums in the country. And for those of you who are genuinely interested in helping to support it, you see me afterwards and I'll be happy to give you some additional information. I know my time is about up. Let me conclude by uh, making a, a couple of final observations. I was delighted on yesterday to see Bad Blood, an excellent documentary. And I was so happy that it was nothing like Miss Evel's Boys, but did do an accurate job of setting forth what had taken place in the study. It points up several important things. One, the study was improperly conducted and it should never have occurred. Two, the President of the United States acknowledged that fact that the government was wrong and apologized to the nation. And if you go back and look at, and we have this at the museum, uh, we were able to get a bank to give us in Tuskegee a, 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 a building. And there's a big chandelier, and right under the chandelier, there is in nice, beautiful marble, the names of all 623 men. And you're able to see it from as far as 20 or 30 feet away. And there's a kiosk right behind it, and a part, one side of that kiosk sets out the entire apology, where you can push a button and see and hear all of the speeches uh, that were made. So secondly, the President of the United States acknowledged the fact that the government was wrong and apologized to the nation. In addition, Vice President Al Gore, Surgeon General David Satcher, and Herman Shaw, considering all the speeches made that day, the central theme that prevailed were how bad the study was and that it should never happen again. The best way to be sure this never happened again is to keep the story before the public. Thus this conference is one of those things doing just that. These men only ask one thing for themselves. That is that a permanent memorial be placed in Tuskegee where people will be able to come and see where they live, where they are buried, and how they suffered. They played a role in the formation of the Tuskegee History Center. What lessons should we learn? I think there are several. As a result of the participation in the study, I was invited to bring four of those persons, and I've already told you about the health care, the fact that as a result of what Senator Kennedy's committee, there is now laws on the book which will prohibit that from occurring again. Finally, I want to thank you for your help. I want to invite you to come to Tuskegee and see the History Museum 
and invite you to be a part of it. We hope at some point to be able to have at that museum as much of the records as we can get so that people will be able to come and see and study some of the things about the study in the setting in which it occurred. We hope this symposium and the two addresses that you have heard here today will set the stage as you go forth in your discussion this afternoon on health issues to the end that what happened to these men will never happen again. Finally, let me say, I think the last thing these men would want to happen is for individuals to not participate in properly conducted health care research and trials because of what happened to them. I think they would say that they suffered and that others might have the benefit of proper research and proper care for individuals who participate. I think a part of their legacy would be not to let what happened to them happen again. Thank you very much.